Thank you, Lord, that we were able to complete the worship this morning early, and now we've come, come back to complete the day with those members of our family who have not had service. I begin by reading our announcements. Condolences to the Wright family on the loss of their cousin. Can you pray for the Blackwell family during that time of bereavement as Brother Blackwell Sr. was funeralized on Wednesday? Continue prayers for the health of Brother McDuffie and family, Sister Sheree Warner, Sister Doris Smith, Sister Sheree Marshall, Sister Sharon Foster. Prayers for Brother McHenry and family who will be traveling out of town. Our ladies' meeting will be rescheduled for a later date. Our ladies' class will resume on site Saturday, April 15th at 10 o'clock a.m. Our Thursday Sunday fellowship will be Sunday, April 16th at 4 o'clock p.m. 4 o'clock p.m. here at the university. The surgery went well for Sister Bonita Brown. She's home recuperating. Continue to keep her in your prayers. And prayers for Brother Ray Knight, Onstead Williams, the brother-in-law of Sister Wade, Sister Bonita Brown, and Sister Lizzie Stubbs. Sister Lizzie Stubbs, we got a word um, that's her, on her passing on yesterday, last evening. Prayers for the health of, sister, of Brenda Elder, the daughter of Sister Emma Brown. Continued prayers, prayers for Brother and Sister Cottenham, Brother and Sister McLean, Sister Patricia Gaines and family, Sister Lachelle Wallace and family, Sister Jill King. Sister Jill King is she's now traveling with her with her family. Pamela Ely, Constance Williams, Ruth Wade, Sister Kathy Pope, Sister Nicole Bird and brothers Donald Nelson, Melvin Flowers, Wayne Brown, and Demario Brown. Trent Johnson, who is in hospice, and Marcus Atkinson. On our roster this evening, we have myself, brother Donald Nelson, brother Cedric Hampton, okay, and Brother Frank Barnes will take us to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Let us go to God in prayer. God our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, this remaining portion of your service. We pray, Lord, that what we do will be pleasing and acceptable unto you. We thank you, Lord, for the earlier worship service. We thank you for the tremendous number of worshipers who was here with us. Thank you, Lord, for the message which was, had, was brought by our manservant, Brother Terrence McLean, and we pray a bountiful prayer for Sister McLean. Please, Lord, bless us as we go to our service this evening. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. amen. Now, Brother Greg Shields is gonna lead us in our singing. Again, good evening to you as well. Um, let's try 637 when morning comes. When morning comes, <clears throat> trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the way that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But He'll guide us with His eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand. Stand it better by and by. we sing it by and by. Lord, when morning comes, yes, and all the saints of God are gathering when we will take the story of how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. We are often destitute of the things that life demands. Want of shelter and the food, thirsty hills and barren land. But we're trusting in the Lord and according to his word we will understand it better by and by. we sing by and by Lord, when the morning comes we'll and all the saints of god 
gathering, man, we will tell the story of how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. A temptation in snares often take us on away. Uh, and our hearts are made to bleed for a thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test uh, when we try to do our best. Uh, we will understand it better by and by. We say by and by. Yes, and all the saints of God are gathering, and we will tell the story of how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Let's um, let's try. Uh, 240, and I'll be listening, after which we'll have our meditation, scripture reading, and prayer. Meditation, scripture reading, and prayer. <clears throat> when the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When the Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere. I'll be somewhere. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere. I'll be somewhere. I'll be somewhere. Listening for my name. Uh, if my heart is right, will he cause me? If my heart is right, I will hear. Uh, if my heart is right, will he cause me? I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere. I'll be somewhere. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my road be his wife, when he calls me, if my road be his wife, I will hear. If my road be his wife, when he calls me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. And I'll be somewhere, I'll be somewhere, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. And I'll be somewhere, I'll be somewhere, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Good evening. Good evening. This evening meditation will come from Matthew chapter 28, um, verses 1 through 7. Once again, that's Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 7. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. 
His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake, and the king has dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Amen. This evening's scripture will be coming from Jeremiah, the chapters 29. Um, and we'll be looking at verses 10 through 14. Once again, that's Jeremiah, the chapters 29, verses 10 through 14. And it reads, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, ye shall go and pray unto me, and I shall hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will, return, I will turn away your captivity. And I will gather you from all, all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I cause you to be carried away captive. Once again, I just read unto you, Jeremiah, the chapter is 29, verses 10 through 14. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers, readers, and doers of his word. Now we'll be led in prayer by Brother Frank Barnes. Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus when the sun goes down, everybody ought to love him, go ahead and love him, love him in the morning, love him in the noontime, love him, love him, love him when the sun goes down. Let us pray to our God, our Father in heaven. We thank you once again for your grace and your mercy for allowing us to be here in your presence to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we pray that our efforts today will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We thank you once again for your manservant who will be delivering the message this evening. May you continue to bless him and Sister McLean. Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you for your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who suffered and died on the cross and rose again on the third day. Bless our efforts tonight. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Sing 380 before Brother McLean comes. <clears throat> There is a name I love to hear will I love to say yes word that sounds like music in my ear the sweetest name you'll hear and well now oh how I love Jesus so how I love Jesus, and oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me, it tells me of the Savior's love, who died to set me free, it tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea, and when 
even on Sunday evening, because he first loved me. We are thankful uh, that God Almighty has blessed all of us with the opportunity to continue our worship. We're thankful for everyone who was here this morning and those who are here on this evening. We thank all of our brethren uh, who have led us in various aspects of worship. Uh, so far and will lead us and others following this message on this evening. Amen. God is good all the time and all the time God is, is, is good. Uh, every Sunday evening when we are, we are singing with Brother Greg or whoever the, the song leader is, I, I, I think way, way back when I first obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, up in Michigan and as a matter of fact, it's where I met uh, the late great brother J.S. Winston when he came to the Inkster area. I was preaching for a little congregation uh, out in Romulus, Michigan called the Wayne Course Church, Church of Christ. Okay. And it's just something about when the group is small, everyone puts themselves into the worship. Uh, they're not leaning on somebody else to try to because they know there is in nobody else. And so I just kind of smile as I listen to you all sing praises to God and say, well, God, you just brought me full circle. You're reminding me that it's not really about the number of people that assemble as much as it is about the spirit of the people that assemble. So I want to thank you, uh, brothers, who have led us in various parts of worship and who will lead us later, but also thank you who are present with us here in, in the auditorium. I, I want you to turn with me in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 29, and uh, Brother Cedric did a great job in reading uh, the meditation as well as the scripture. Amen. And I wanna read it from the New International Version. Jeremiah chapter 29, and I want to start at verse 1. I only ask him to read verse 10 through 14, but I want to start at verse 1 to get the full context of what is going on as Jeremiah gives a message to the people of God. It's a letter that Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the exiles. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the court officials, and 
The leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elisa, son of Shaphan, and to Gamariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, verse 4, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Plans to prosper, prosper you. Pray with me. Gracious Father, thank you for this day and another opportunity you've given us to come together and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We are especially thankful for those who are present this evening who did not have uh, the opportunity to join us in worship on uh, this morning. Thank you for preserving their lives and thank you for their desire to be in the midst of the saints on this evening. Thank you for all of us who have come together And our prayer is that all that we have done, all that we will do, will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Father, would you use me as your mouthpiece, speak through me. May all of us hear your message from your book, the Bible. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. There are a number of verses that are taken out of context, that are quoted in the religious world. One of those verses is contained in this context of Jeremiah 29, when God says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, Plans to give you hope and and a future. Oftentimes in our world, we hear people quote this passage of scripture who aren't even children of God. They aren't even God's family. I fear while our text for tonight from Jeremiah 29, 11 has been copied and calligraphed on plaques and posters It has not always been clearly understood in its context. The King James Version says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. In the New American Standard Bible, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. 
And then as I read in the NIV, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has used this verse in many of our lives to fan our faith, to help us hang on with hope in hopeless situations. No doubt these words are a literal lifeline for many going through tough times. But they're not always used appropriately, especially by those who are not members of, of the body of Christ. In chapter 1, verse number 10 of Jeremiah, God said, See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Now, one thing I want us to be mindful of tonight is that as we look at the context in which these verses are set, the one thing we ought to always remember in our lives is that God will not always do what we desire but he will always do what he decides. I want to repeat that. God will not always do what we desire, but he will always do what he decides. What is he trying to get us to learn from this text? I think there are five lessons from Jeremiah 29, really verse 1 through 14. And I want to give you those five lessons, and then I'm going to let you go home. I promise we will be done by midnight. <laughs> Brother Frank said, thank you. The first thing I want is to look at verse number four. And notice it says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. The first lesson that you and I need to learn is this, that we must submit to God's sovereignty. Amen. The very first thing they needed to know is the same thing that we must settle in our lives, and that is God does what he does when he does the way he wants to do it. We must recognize who God is. God refers to himself with two titles as the Lord of hosts and also translated the God of the angel armies or Lord Almighty. He is Yahweh, the transcendent, mighty, and all-powerful God, and he is also the God of Israel, meaning he is in a special relationship with his people. He's Elohim, the creator, and the covenant-keeping God. And to put both of these names together, God is powerful, but God is also personal. He is resplendent and relational. He is majestic, but he's also mine. He is infinite, but he's also imminent. That means that he is near. We need to recognize who God is, and we need to respond to what God does. Notice that from verse 4, it is God who sent the exiles from Jerusalem to Babylon. He repeats this in verse 7, I have sent you into exile. In verse 1, we read that it was Nebuchadnezzar who took them into exile, but he was simply the instrument that God used. I'm sure this made no sense to the people, and sometimes what God does doesn't make sense to us either. I knew I wouldn't get a lot of amens on that one. He is God, and you are not, and I am not. God does what he wants to do. God's train runs on God's track. He does what pleases him, not what pleases you and I. He is the potter and we are the clay. His ways are not our ways and we have to be okay with that. I love what Tony Evans says. He says, everything is either caused by God or allowed by God and there is no third category. It's either caused by him or he allows it. 
God will not always do what we desire, but he will always do what he decides. That's our first lesson. Second lesson is this. We, we need to just simply bloom where we have been planted. It's easy to lament how bad things are, how pagan our culture is right now, and how our country seems to have lost its mind, and we might desire to retreat from where God has placed us. I often joke with Sister McLean and I say, now, if certain people get elected or they do some certain things, I'm going to move to Canada. And she always likes to remind me, how do you know they want you? <laughs> they may not want you there. And so sometimes we find ourselves in difficult situations and yet notice what God says to these exiles while they are in Babylon. In Psalm 137, verse 1 through 2, and then verse 4, it says, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Well, here in Jeremiah 29, God gives the Israelites two commands. The first thing he says to them, I want you to settle down. In verse 5 and 6, he says, I want you to build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. And they are to do it while they are in Babylon. Instead of chafing and complaining about their culture, they were to settle in and settle down and live out what God told Adam to do in Genesis 1.22, be fruitful and multiply. But not only does God say to them, I want you to settle down, I want you to saturate around in this society that you live in. They were to build houses, but they were also to open their doors. Verse 7 would have startled them when God said, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. In other words, God says to you and I, I know you live in America. I know America is not the best place right now because of its immorality and its amorality. I know the political unrest is all around you. I know that folks have lost their minds, but he says, I want you to seek their welfare. The word seek is active. It's not passive. They were to influence and impact by seeking the city's success and prosperity as well as peace among the people. They were to live on mission where God had planted them by pressing on, knowing that God had a purpose for his people in the place where he had put them. So the next time you want to, claim, uh, you want to complain about living in Cleveland or the surrounding area or living in this country, just realize God has us here for a reason. We are to be that city set up on a hill. We are to be that light on the candlestick. We are to be the salt of the earth. What about you? What about me? Will we go where love is most needed? Remember your neighbor is anyone in need that you come across. And your neighbor lives in your neighborhood, works in your workplace, studies on your campus. God has placed you and I where we are on purpose, for his purposes. And if you want to learn more about how to saturate our society without compromising our convictions, just read the book of Daniel, since he also lived in Babylon. And then, number three, we need to flee false promises. One of the biggest challenges Jeremiah had was dealing with the prosperity prophets. We thought that was new. It's not new. They were promising peace and a short stay of only two years in Babylon. 
But verse 8 and 9 of Jeremiah 29 says this, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. That's why people really need to be careful about listening to prosperity preachers even today. They prophesy peace and financial favor, and it doesn't necessarily mean that God wants everyone to be healthy and wealthy. Amen. I didn't get, get a lot of amens on that one. Often they misuse Jeremiah 29, 11 to say that God never wants anything bad to happen in our lives, that simply naming it and claiming it I get it for you, but that's not true. As a matter of fact, when Jesus walked this earth, he said, the poor you have with you always. And what makes that even worse is we don't know whether we're the ones included in that number. <laughs> but God says to them in verse 10, before we get to verse 11 of Jeremiah 21, for I have set my face against this city for harm and not for good, declares the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. Again, God will not always do what we desire, but he will always do what he decides. The fourth thing is, is this. We need to trust God's timing. Someone once said, when we don't wait on God, we will always wish that we had. I like that. When we don't wait on God, we will always wish that we had. The next facet of fortifying our faith is to trust God's timing. And he gives us reasons in the text why we can do this. Number one, God will fulfill this promise. In verse number 10, it says, For thus says the Lord, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. 70 years is a long, long time. But he says, I will fulfill my promise I made 70 years ago when the time is right. And no matter how bad it gets, it can only last a lifetime. That means many of the exiles will never return. Their children will and their grandchildren will, but many of those who went into exile are not going to live past 70 years. Amen. The word... For complete, it means to be satisfied. God laid this timeline out on purpose, and when it was fulfilled, he would visit his people, which means he would search out to attend and return them to their land. You can always, I can always count on God's promises. In Daniel 9, verse 1 through 3, it says that he read this exact passage in Jeremiah almost 70 years, seven decades later, and learned that the captivity was about to end. And it says, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So Daniel then called for fasting and repentance to prepare the people for their return. God will fulfill his promise, and God has plans for his people. Verse 11 is the one that's always quoted. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. In the King James Version, that word for plans is also translated as thoughts. And in fact, the Hebrew text of this verse uses thoughts or thinking three times. 
And it says to you and I that God is thinking about his people all the time. When he says the plans I have for you, that's in the plural and it's the second person. It means that God cares for the people that he has called to himself and that's us, the church today. How often are people bewailing what's going to happen to the church as long as God sits on the throne, nothing. From our human perspective, it might seem like we're not winning, but remember Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. God is always thinking about his people, and God is always thinking about us individually. It is mind-blowing that there are over six billion people on this planet, and God has thoughts about it, all six billion of those people. Psalm 139, verse 17 and 18 said, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than, than the sand. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 29 through 31, that not a sparrow hits the ground without God knowing, and that God cares so much about us that he knows the very number of hairs on our head. So he knows how many you and I woke up with this morning. He knows how many we lost when we combed, or in my case, brushed it. And he knows how many we have even at this very moment. God cares for us individually. God knows what he's doing. God would not always do what we desire, but he will always do what he decides. And incidentally, before this time of captivity, God's people were prone to idol worship. This 70-year time of exile seemed to cure them of that. We now realize that there is not but one God. And him only will we serve. And God desires good for his people. The word for welfare is shalom, which refers to wholeness and peace. God is great and good and gracious, and like Joseph declared in Genesis 50, verse 20, he loves to bring good out of that which may look bad. Joseph said to his brethren, you meant it for good or for evil against me, but God meant it for good. And if God means things for our good, there will be a bright future. He said, I will give you an expected end. That's one reason I love Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6, because it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it or complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And then the fifth lesson that we need to learn from Jeremiah 29 is this. There is a connection between verse 10 and 11 and verse 12. God's promises and his plan should compel us to call out to him. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. It's similar to what God said in Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Verse 13 of Jeremiah 29 is a good reminder that we cannot be passive in our relationship with God. God says you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Is that still in your Bible? You will find me when you seek me with all your heart. We're called not to be half-hearted, but to be wholehearted. I'm reminded of one preacher who said in this regard that if you're 95% committed to Christ, you're still 5% short. It leads to the question, are you seeking him with all you have? When you long after the Lord, you'll find what you're looking for in life. And we should never put it off 
even for a day, because one day it will be too late. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And then lastly, verse 14, God says, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations. In all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Don't you love that God will not ultimately abandon his people or abdicate his promises? So we've learned tonight that God will not always do what we desire, but he will always do what he desires. What do we need to do? Submit to his sovereignty. Bloom what we're planted. Flee false promises. Trust God's timing and seek him wholeheartedly. And although the Old Testament we see the thread of redemption as God preserves the line of Judah and throne of David, the ultimate fulfillment of Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 is found in Jesus. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, The Lord is our Righteousness. In the midst of all of the judgment in the book of Jeremiah, we see glimpses of grace. Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Jeremiah weeps with his people and for his people. And Jesus does the same when he sees his people rejecting his love. So in Luke 19, 41 and 42, we read, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. In Jeremiah 31, 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And Jesus said in Luke 22, in verse number 20, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I am so grateful to be under the new covenant that is ratified by the blood of Jesus. Plans to prosper you. So the next time now somebody quotes that to you and and they're talking about God is going to give them a car or a house or a half million dollar lottery ticket or whatever it is they're talking about. And you say, no, 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 that's not what that text means. That text means that the people of God recognize God's sovereignty and we accept God's timing and we flee from false promises and we know that we have a bright future in Christ Jesus. Tonight, if you are not a child of God, you might be watching this, not tonight, but maybe later on Facebook or YouTube, and you are not a child of God. The same thing that we say in the morning is the same thing you have to do in the evening if you want to become a child of God. Hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. Believe the gospel. Repent of your sins, confess Christ with the mouth, and be buried in water for the remission of sins, and then arise to walk in the newness of life. And if you are a child of God, and maybe you feel like you are in exile, you can be restored in your walk with God. He simply says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. First John chapter 1, around verse number 7. Or maybe you just simply need prayer. You know that as you go into the week ahead, that there's trouble everywhere from the White House to my house, and we all need God to see us through. Will you come right now as we together stand and sing? 686. <clears throat> oh, do not let the word depart. And close thine eyes against the light 
Thank you to all of you who are here tonight, and our prayer is that you have been blessed by the message, that God has been pleased with the message, the motive behind it, the method of its delivery, its content, and that he has gotten the glory, that Jesus has been exalted, and that you as a child of God have been encouraged and built up in the most holy and precious faith. And if anybody is watching, listening, Whatever you're doing and you've not yet obeyed the gospel, my prayer is that God will take this word, prick your heart, and move you to respond in humble obedience to the gospel of Christ. For all of you Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. And whether you're Christian or not, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake. At the church said, hey, man, another fine message. As a result of the message, we have a few responses. Sister Beverly Hood wants you to continue to pray for her mother and her friend. Also, she's asking prayer for Sister Jill King, who is settling in nicely in Virginia. Also, we want to remember Kenyatta and the Stubbs family on the loss of Sister Stubbs, and we want to remember Kimberly Hightower, that God will restore her sight. We want to continue to pray for all of those who are traveling, for Brother Brian, who's uh, returning from Washington tonight, that he may have uh, traveling grace. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow before your throne of grace and mercy. On behalf of Brother Kevin Edmiston, who has a doctor's appointment on tomorrow, that his appointment will be a good positive one, but we know that all things are possible through you. And continue to pray for Sister Hood, her mother, and her health problems and her family. And Father, we thank you so much for allowing Sister Jill King to reach Virginia safely. Continue to wrap your loving arms around her. Continue to bless her. Continue to pray for the Stubb family, Sister Kenyatta and the family. And we pray, Father, for a good recovery for Kimberly Hightower, that you may restore her sight. And we pray for traveling grace for Brian and all of those who are traveling, the McHenry family. Father, these are our prayers in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now as we enter into our communion service, Charles' um, song, it would have went well with, uh, with our Sunday school lesson this morning. Uh, it's 292, I am the vine. Mm -hmm. I am, I am the vine. <laughs> 292. I am the vine, and ye are the branches, bear precious fruit for Jesus. 
Jesus today. Branches in him no fruit ever bearing. Jesus has said he'll take it away. I am the vine and ye are the branches. I am the vine, be faithful and true. Ask what ye will, your prayer shall be granted. The Father loved me, so I have loved you. God has blessed those who were not able to commune this morning to be with us this evening. God's word says in Mark 14, starting with verse number 22, and as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Heavenly Father, we bow before your throne of grace and mercy, thanking you for this opportunity to commune in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you will bless the bread and that you will bless the fruit of the vine as we take these in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray that we do so in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am the vine and you are the branches. I am the vine, be faithful and true. Ask what ye will, your prayer shall be granted. The Father loved me so. come to that part of the service where we can recognize those who had not an opportunity to give earlier today in, in answering to the, to the command, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. God is a good God. We always use those, those terms, that terminology, God is good. God gives us everything that we have, and everything we have comes from God. And we are only commanded to give back a portion to the Lord. This is uh, our means, our measure of giving. This is not a command that we should follow uh, just haphazardly. God says, with, it, with good measure, with good measure, give unto others as has been given unto you. Let us go to God in prayer. God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for finances. We thank you for riches. We thank you for the spirit of giving. We thank you for the perfect example in that you gave. You gave your son. You give us life. You give us miracles. You give us everything that we have. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. Amen. I did not receive any visitor cards. If we have visiting guests, between us, I don't recognize any visitors. Kindly stand that we may recognize you and understand and know that you are our honored guest. We want to once again we want to thank Brother McLean for two meaningful messages today. God's word. God always sends his word down to us, the message which we need, which will help us, which will build us up. Now let's prepare for our benediction prayer. Please stand. Yes. Before we have the final song, 
Reverend Douglas McHenry texted me earlier. He is out of town. He went to Atlanta uh, to be with his youngest brother. Uh, his brother has been put in hospice, mm -hmm. so they will not be coming back until Wednesday. They've been told that there are only a few days left, and he said it was okay for me to make that happen. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, This our, clo our, our closing song. It, it, it's a familiar song amongst us, if you will. And um, there's a gentleman by the name of Anthony J. Showalter who takes credit for writing this song. Writing this song, it's been done in various ways. And, uh, I, I, I kind of want to change just the last lyric on this last part of that song because it's a song that says, "Don't you want to go to that land mm -hmm. where I'm bound, where I'm bound." Well, be totally. I don't, I don't know where he's bound for. So, uh, so we can just sing it. Uh, uh, where Jesus is, <laughs> where Jesus is. Don't you wanna go to that land? Don't you wanna go to that land? Don't you wanna go to that land? What Jesus said, what Jesus said, uh, don't you want to go to that land? Uh, don't you want to go to that land? Yeah, don't you want to go to that land? What Jesus said, uh, Jesus said, well, I've got a Savior uh, in that land. Uh, I've got a Savior in that land. I've got a Savior in that land. What Jesus said, what Jesus said, I've got a Savior in that land. I've got a Savior in that land. Yeah, I've got a Savior in that land. Where Jesus is. Let us pray together. God, our Father in heaven, once again, you caused your, your servants to come together and worship and serve you. Yes. We pray, Lord, that the, the songs we have sung and the prayers were pleasing and acceptable unto you. Please, Lord, bless our families, bless our loved ones, bless the members of the University of Churches of Family, bless the Churches of Christ throughout the land and country. Yes. Please go with us. Bless us, Lord, cause us every day to wake up and do the things that are pleasing and unpleasant unto you. We want to be representative of you, Lord. We want everyone to see who sees us to say that's God's child. Mm -hmm. So we just thank you, Lord, for the messages which we have received. We thank you for your manservant who's delivered them. Yes. We thank you for Sister McClain. We pray that you will continue to bless her. We we, we pray that you'll continue to bless those members of our family who are sick and well, sisterhood's mother and sisterhood's friend. And we just thank you, Lord. We pray and thank you for guarding us, for guiding us, for being our Lord and Father, for being the, the, the blessed physician that you are so we can come to you with all our wishes and all our cares. Thank you, Lord, as we go our separate directions. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. 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 amen.